So we are down to the wire here. And uh, that's primarily because the closing game is coming up fast in one hour. So unfortunately, we're not going to have a two-hour okay. session like, like it says in the schedule. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to learn all about uh, some more advanced aspects of, uh, of the Octo project. And um, with uh, Tim Morling here, otherwise known as Timo, on, uh, on IRC and so on. Uh, and then roughly at uh, half past uh, 5, at 5.30, we will uh, all... Uh, pile our stuff together and yeah. run downstairs like mad things yeah. to the closing games. So um, uh, do ask questions as they come up. Just bear in mind that we've got some great material and uh, we don't want to run out of time. So we might cut you off and say, come and talk to us after the closing game. Yeah. All right. So with that, and, no further ado. And if I get to the end up. and we don't have question times like 10 minutes before you want to stop, sure. then start flagging me. Wh whatever works. Okay. Okay, um, so just a little bit about me. Um, I was a hobbyist, just like you. Um, about 12 years ago, I started looking at embedded stuff quite a bit and uh, started working on Open Embedded. Back in those days, it was called Open Embedded um, and then became Open Embedded Classic and so on. Um, so I've been around this for a very, very long time, but I, I kind of immediately fell in love with it, started being a volunteer contributor which then turned into you know, a, an actual real job. Um, so, and by the way, I don't have a computer science degree. I was a materials engineer, and I taught for five years, and I worked in a winery and a whole bunch of other craziness, but um, so here we are. So, so this session is kind of the advanced Yocto session, right? You you've already had one earlier. It was kind of the intro to, to BitBake and other things like that. So I'm, I'm trying to build on top of that. We did our best to try to sync um, between our material, so hopefully this stuff will, will make sense. But um, I'm just going to do a little bit of uh, background that may be different than what you already saw. So, um, and I always try to bring a little humor in. So, um, so Yaka Project is actually a, a Linux Foundation project, um, and what it's there for is to help you build your own Linux distribution. So, don't say you know I'm running on Yocto, right? That doesn't mean that if you're, you're not running on Fedora, you're not running Debian, you're not running Arch Linux. You built your own. So you should be saying, if your name's Fred, I'm running Fred Linux, or you know, I'm running Josie Linux, or whatever. So, um, so uh, it's a collection of tools that lets you make your own distribution and make make it easier to do this. Um, there's other tools like BuildRoot, right? And a lot, a lot of other ways to do that. And some people might say BuildRoot is way easier. Yocto is also the smallest unit of um, unit prefix in the SI system. So it's 10 to the minus 24 or whatever it was. So it's very, very small. And that was the idea originally. So Yocto project underneath it is built on top of the Open Embedded build system. So Open Embedded uses another tool. It's a completely different project called BitBake. Um, and this was inspired way back when by Gentoo and the uh, portage, portage or portage, however you want to say it, system and eBuild. So if you go and you look at how Gentoo is built, now that you maybe know a little bit about what some of the recipes or things look like or after this class, you'll see some familiarity. So long time ago, 10 years ago, when I was working on this stuff before Yocto Project was created, um, there, there was Open Embedded and Open Zaris and a few other things. And those all came together um, into what is now known as Open Embedded Classic. And it was a lot more like what BuildRoot is now, where basically it was one big monolithic tree of everything for everybody. But it got unmanageable, and so um, it really didn't work out. Um, it's a uh, not, an or, Open Embed is a not-for-profit organization. Um, it's really just out there to try to help people like you that want to get into embedded Linux. Um, so another term that's out there is Pocky. Um, it's not Pokey, it's Pocky. So Pocky is a distribution, but it's a reference distribution, and it's really only there to make sure that Yocto Project is working and everything's working out and everything builds. Um, it also has, happens to be a con conveniently different and legally, you know, it's felt differently and legally different than a uh, chocolate candy of the same name in Japan, which actually was what it was named after. So um, all this came out of a company called Open Hand that the, the owner of it was kind of a fan of Japanese culture, and so that's where that came from. Um, so it's not Pokey, which is the uh, the horse companion to uh, you know to a, a green claymation character that I think some of you are old enough to remember. So, um, and I don't like when people say Pokey because it makes it sound slow. 
and that is kind of a pain point, so I'd rather have you say Pocky. So, all right, so what is it? So it's, it's these three tools, or three repos, really, if you want to think about it that way. It uses a thing called Combo Layer, knits it all together into one monolithic thing, and that's Pocky. So if we look at the tree of that, we've got the bit bake up there is one tool that was brought in. Um, we've got meta and OE init build environment and scripts and probably something else in there that I forgot, which are all part of open embedded core. And all the stuff in black is the rest of it, which is what Yakko project has produced. And all those came together uh, or sorry, that's what came out of the meta meta Yakto layer. Um, so the meta meta Yakto repository is actually multiple layers. It's the meta Pocky layer and these other things. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff that's all there together to to give you the build system. So enough history. Um, let's talk a little bit about building images and, and what they are. So what do I mean by an image? I think you guys probably have this by this point because you've done this a bunch of times. But um, you know you've got the boot directory with the bootloader, whatever that happens to be. So it could be U-boot, it could be you know, many other things. It could be um, EFI, Grub, et cetera. You've got your kernel, obviously, and the kernel modules. Um, but really what we're, what we're talking about here, it, more importantly, is the root FS, right? There's a lot of other ways to build the, the kernel, but we're gonna build up the full um, root FS, including Etsy and var and user and all these other things. And this is really what we're after. And that's what I mean by image is all of this put together as an image. So like you already probably did earlier, um, you're gonna go clone the Pocky or whatever in this, you know, you can do it a, a, the more traditional way, um, which is clone Bitbake by itself and clone OE core and clone whatever else you wanna clone. Or you can just save time as a hobbyist and just do um, get clone Pocky. And once you do that, we have to set up our build environment, so you have to figure out what kind of machine are you going to build for, what's your target, all these other things. And so we run this uh, init script. And if you just if you just run that and you don't make any changes at all, by default, it's going to give you QMU x86. And the reason is there's this variable called machine. It's got the question question. That means you haven't done anything else. And so I'm just going to that's if you have done nothing else, told me nothing else, I'm giving you the default. And also the other thing is that if you don't give it a build directory, it's gonna just assume you want to have a build directory called build right where you are. Um, I never do this. I always put my build directories up higher and I have build directories named, you know, build for Carlos, because I'm working for Carlos today and doing something for him, right, or that kind of thing. So all, all of my build directories have some kind of functional name, but it's easier to do it this way for you guys. So to actually build the images, um, I think we already, you guys already saw to bake core image minimal. Um, so this one's a just minimal boot image, it's, it's, but it's got a problem, which is it's got small partitions. So if you end up putting GCC and all these things into it, and you boot into it, and then you wanna build your own applications, you'll end up running out of space in that partition, because it wasn't designed for it to grow or have any extra space. And so I really, I very, very rarely use core image minimal. This is probably the most common target in the Octo project or in Bitbake, but I, I, I almost never use it. Um, Bitbake core image base goes a little bit more uh, than that and does not have that init RAMFS kind of model, so it's, it's bigger and it's got a few more console things. I always use Bitbake core image full command line um, because that's got more tools and editors and things like that, and, and that's, that's my favorite. Um, there's also this core image Sato. Um, this is, again, another you know, Japanese word. That's, that's why it's Sato. And this is this reference graphical desktop. It would be reminiscent of a smartphone from the 90s, roughly. So um, it's, not, it's, you know, it's not something you really want to be using as a product, but it, it, it was designed for testing purposes, and, and it worked. So um, I talked a bit about layers already, probably already kind of got lost with, with some of the stuff that I might have been saying there. So let me just kind of give you an idea of, of why the layers. So let's go back to Open Embedded Classic again, okay? Um, so nothing against BuildRoot, but it, the, the idea in BuildRoot build is that all everything you need is all right there, right? And you just use menu config to change everything. Um, 
it's all monolithic and it makes it difficult for them to upgrade or for other people to roll their own version of it and things like that. Um, so in the, back in the old open embedded classic days, um, it was just one gigantic uh, repository. So everything that is now in meta open embedded and all these other, a lot of other layers was all originally all in one place and it was a mess. And it was very, very difficult to understand what was going on or change it. So we all discovered that we needed a lot more flex flexibility, modularity, and it needed to be distributed. And when I say distributed, it needed to be distributed to other people being involved. So we needed to have you to be able to create your own stuff and not affect anybody else and, and live in your own, you know, your own world and have it work or have different vendors work together. So um, there's some ab abstraction going on here. Um, we've got, you know, concepts that belong in the distro or in the machine, the image, or, or the recipe. So the kind of things that you want to put into your distro, one of the things, the main reason I tell people to do a distro is because you want to have branding. You don't want your login screen to say Pocky Linux. You want it to say Fred Linux or EAL Linux, right? Um, but there's other things in there. So when you're going to build your image, if you aren't going to use GCC and you're going to use Muscle, what did that affect? Everything that got built. That has to be a distro level choice. So that's why it's a distro feature. Or if you're going to use systemd instead of sysd init, that's another thing, right? So those are the kind of things that go into your distro concept. X11 or you know, instead of Wayland. So then you've got your machine concept. So what goes into the machine? You've got your kernel, right? Because that was specifically configured for a specific chip and maybe even a specific board, right? That's not a distro thing. That's not Fedora. That's you know, ARM or x86 or whatever it is, right? Um, so the other thing is your bootloader and all the drivers and everything for your, your peripherals. All that stuff's got to be abstracted out to this machine concept. And then you got your image concept where you're going to put in, you know, what's going to be in there. This is kind of more of the functional stuff. Um, so then we got the other layer of this, the recipe or the, the, the information that's going to build your stuff, the metadata. Um, and this is giving me your scripts and applications and things like that. So I want to thank my, my buddy Stefano for, uh, he gave a talk on um, real world Yocto experience that you should go watch the video. Um, and that came straight out of that. So take that, those levels of abstraction, let's make them into layers. So we're going to have a distro layer, right? Some meta my distro. We just use meta because it's metadata and it's just been kind of a tribal thing. Um, but that would be what I might call this layer. And I'm going to decide whether I'm running X11 or Wayland or systemd or, or sysd init. So um, I'm not going to put my kernel in there. I'm going to put my kernel into the hardware layer, the BSP layer. So board support package is what that stands for. Um, and this is where you're going to have something for hardware. So LCD support or e-paper or Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or whatever, or some kind of specific automotive kind of stuff that that you need, like CAN bus or something like that, right? That's what's going to go in that hardware layer. Um, your software layer, <coughs> layer now is where you're going to put your applications, right? So uh, you want to run my Minecraft on your Raspberry Pi. So now you're going to go put Minecraft in. Should that have gone in your distro? Were you creating the, the Minecraft distro? No, it's, it's an application. So that, that's a different place. Um, and this is also where you can put, you know, if you're a contractor, you're going to put your customer applications in their own layer that you can give them when you walk away, and then they can maintain it. And support tools and stuff like that. There's also kind of the, the concept layer, what I call a functional layer. And this is different than an application layer because this is grouped for some functional concept reason. Um, maybe it's, you know, MetaPython or something like that. Um, so it might be, you know, some other uh, functionality that you're after, something to do with manufacturing or over-the-air updates or something like that. All right, so a little bit more in, inside of what is a layer. Um, so inside of um, Pocky, there's a directory called Metaskeleton, and that's this organization of these different uh, files. So you've got a, a couple things that are required. You've got um, a layer.conf underneath the conf file. And that layer.conf is what 
tells everybody what's the name of you know what's the kind of machine name of your layer and what priority is it and things like that. And you might have other things like um, you know a multi-lib configuration to allow you to have x you know 32-bit and 64-bit at the same time, or you might have machines or something else in there. Um, always put in a license. If you're planning on your thing being open source, just start immediately from the beginning, always having a license there, right? Um, you're gonna have some kind of recipes, in this case, you know, BusyBox. Um, they, these are just examples that they put in there, or a kernel. Um, maybe there's some images uh, that you're gonna put in there as examples. Um, some other recipes, so maybe you've got a service for system D or maybe you're going to add um, default users that are always going to be in there. And so you go ahead and create, um, use, do user add. So these are all just the kind of things that are in there. But the main thing to remember is you always have to have that layer.conf. And it has to be underneath the conf folder. So it's a little bit rigid in that, re that regard, but um, it, it, it works to do it this way. So if we do a distro layer, it's different than that. This was kind of a generic layer, right? This is, this is no big deal. but. So the distro layer is different because under conf, you've also got a distro folder, and now we add you know, eal.conf, right? So um, that's our actual eal distro. Also, when you first start it up, um, it's gonna populate a local folder um, in your build directory, and if you don't give it anything else, it's gonna use the defaults for the DB layers. Which layers are you gonna use? Or, or which, um, what's your local con configuration gonna be? And what you can actually do is use these sample files to actually um, pre-populate that stuff. Um, and then we've got some different recipes. And in this case, for this, this distro layer that I created for you guys, um, I wanted to show you branding, and so I used um, ASCII art in what turns out to be um, in base files, and it's uh, Etsy issue is actually where that that thing that goes comes in above the login is is actually in that file. So BSP layer is a little bit different, right? Now we're talking about the machine or the board or the kernel, and so I didn't want to go too complicated on you guys, so I actually just literally copied and pasted. Um, Dennis Dmitrienko from uh, TI is here. I actually copied and pasted some of his his uh, files and created a pocket beagle configuration for our machine for educational purposes. This is not the way I would normally have done this, but I just didn't want to complicate things too much. And then we've got um, the U-boot, so we have to have our bootloader, we've got our kernel, so I actually went ahead and created a, 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 Lin a Linux pocket beagle um, kernel, and this takes all the stuff that Michael Welling and others have shown earlier about the actual um, configuration, so the patches that we needed to do the device tree and things like that and the def config that we're gonna, we're gonna use, I put in there. And then there's a thing called WIC, which is a tool that uh, allows you to build your SD card image, so it's got all the information in there in or order to build your complete multi-partition image, and I went ahead and generated that. So this kind of gives you an idea what's in a BSP layer. So how did I make them? I for all of those, I literally did bit bake layers, create layer, and then the name of it, and just tell it the path. So the name should be a full path. Um, the other way you could do it is just copy somebody else's layer and just you know, copy and paste it and, and add to it. But if you're gonna do that, if you're gonna be creating layers, make sure you're consistent. Make sure you're gonna create a distro layer, right? Keep it isolated. Create another layer for the BS BSP. Create another layer for applications. Keep this stuff isolated so that you don't really contaminate the, the pool. Um, so, you might wonder what layers are out there. What, what is there out there? Do I have to create a recipe for every single application I'm gonna do, right? That'd get really, really old really fast. Um, so there's actually this thing out there called um, layers.openembedded.org. Um, and this is a Django app, which um, we all just call it the layer index. Uh, that's, but when we say that, we mean this, this website. And if you look, by default, it's just gonna come up with um, layers and I can go and I can search. So let's say I want to search for um, I want to see if there's anything about Raspberry Pis, right? So there's some Raspberry Pi layers, or I want to see if there's um, uh, variables. 
anyway, let's see, Xilinx. Okay, so I wanna, you know, I wanna look for Xilinx for something for that. So I can search for layers. Um, let's say I wanna find out if there's, where Vim is, right? Because that's my favorite editor. So I can go in and I can look at that. And over here on the right, now you're seeing what these different layers are. You see what the version is. I can actually like click on this and get to what the recipe is and how, how it was built and so on. So I use this tool constantly, all the time, every day. This is my go-to go -to tool. So get in the habit if you're gonna be working in this space of, of using this tool. Really, really helps. So all those things, the layers, the machines, recipes, all that stuff is all nice and searchable. Um, so one of the things that the Octo Project did is it created, um, there was a real pain point, especially back in the open embedded days, um, cla open embedded classic days, where the workflow was very, very tedious. It was a lot of manual stuff. Everybody was basically very, very comfortable on the command line. We were all VI or your Emacs you know, users, and so we all just had our ways of getting this work done. But um, that didn't really work too well for people like, so maybe you're the systems integrator for your company and you're creating your distribution or whatever, but somebody else is actually writing a web app or you know the individual GUI applications or whatever it is. And so we just started seeing that, um, that we needed a lot more than that. And so the Octo Project came along. One of the things they did, um, and it's about seven years ago, the Octo Project started, so they created an Eclipse plugin to make it easier to use um, to use the uh, the tool chains, the the GCC, glibc, all those things from um, that Yocto is building for you, and so you with the Eclipse Yocto, it used to be known as Eclipse Pocky, but that didn't make any sense actually as the name. It should have been Yocto all all along. So we finally corrected that, um, and I'm one of the maintainers of this. So um, you can go and you can create an auto tools um, project and you know do your normal C code, all that stuff in Eclipse, but it's gonna use the GCC that we built for your specific target. And so we're gonna cross compile now for the Pocket Beagle by using this Eclipse plugin. And it, it knows about CMake and, tr and traditional make files. And also my favorite thing about uh, IDEs is actually the, the debugger, the GDB. Um, because the, the, the debugging in, interface is kind of interesting. Um, so later on this year, we're actually in the middle of completely refreshing this, and we're gonna be leveraging Docker containers so that if you are stuck on a corporate Linux or um, Windows platform, you're actually gonna be able to run this tool and, and do your, your builds and so on using Docker containers and, and not be stuck with only being able to do Linux. Um, so that, the containers was a project called Crops that I was involved in when I first joined. Um, so both Eclipse and, and Crops I, is what I did when I first joined Intel two years ago. So cross, Crops stands for cross platforms, but I always call it Crops, or containers run other people's software. This is how I think of it. Um, and that, that's what I think of Docker as being around for, right? Um, so, with this, it allows us to run on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, and Windows and Mac, you need to use a Samba container because uh, it needs a Linux file system. But it, it allows us to do all the stuff that you guys maybe have been struggling with in VMs and things like that, we could actually have done with Docker containers. Another version of this class, we're, we're gonna do it that way probably. Um, all these containers are actually based on individual um, re, you know, versions of real world uh, distros that you might be using. So uh, Fedora, Debian, Ubuntu, all those things are supported. And there's a bunch of different types of containers um, that you can go and use and you can actually change these and make your own Docker containers. So you know, Yocto base is the base container to go off and do other things. And there's one to, this should be Pocky. Whoops. Anyway. Sorry, Iyaki was supposed to be Pocky container. Um, so anyway, this again, it's just a, a Docker uh, wrapper around um, all these other tools. And one of the things it gives you is re reproducibility and because you know exactly where you start every time you do a container. Um, so I highly, highly recommend, if you're in, at all interested in the Docker aspect of this, go and watch this talk from last year that um, my colleague Randy Witt gave. 
Um, it's really, really great talk. Um, he's the one that really made the container stuff work. Um, so go check that out. So what else did uh, Yakta Project V? Well, you know, a lot of people have software development kits, right? There's for years and years it was. Um, Oh, now I've forgotten, but there's one particular company that produced a bunch of um, SDKs that were out there. Um, and everybody was using the same one for cross-compiling. But um, when Yocto and Open Embedded came along, it made it easier to, um, to create your own tool chain. So if you want to create your own, again, you're just going to use BitBake. You're going to use whatever image target you had. So maybe it was core image minimal. Um, so you're going to do BitBake core image minimal and then run this extra task called um, populate SDK. And what that's going to do is build all of your GCC and you know, all those other tools that you're going to now use to cross-compile, um, rather than relying on some vendor to do that for you. Um, so if you don't want to build your own, you can go and you can get one that was built by Yocto Project. So that URL right there would take you to um, the most recent release of what's already been built for you, and built and tested, and so on. Um, there's another thing. So the problem with the traditional software development kit is it's 100% fixed, right? It, it, there's nothing there that really lets it be flexible. And it doesn't know anything about building images or a whole bunch of other stuff like that. And so they also created um, what's called an extensible SDK. And um, so you populate it with the same kind of, of tool. Um, and again, we can just go and download our own if we don't want to build our own. But this is like, you know, four gigabytes worth of data. And the reason is that um, there's a big difference between what they're trying to pull off. Um, so the standard SDK has your tool chain, your, your debugger. It's maybe hundreds of megabytes. But it doesn't know anything about building images. It's not updatable at all. It's just a tarball that you sent off to somebody. It doesn't know anything about, um, about your root file system or the sysroot. It doesn't know anything about packages. Um, and it's or installed packages or a package manager or anything like that. It's just built out of packages and it's done. What the extensible SDK does is it takes that further uh, at the expense of, of space, but it actually knows how to build an image. So now you can give other people this extensible SDK and then run core image minimal and build, and then they can, they can build it. So the idea here is if somebody in your company is like the build engineer right, or the systems engineer, Every night, you update whatever it is that people just fed you the day before. And then everyone that comes in in the morning, all your developers update to the extensible SDK. And they download the changes. And now they're on top of all of your most recent code base. So everybody's just constantly rolling forward together. That's kind of the idea why this came around. Um, so it's very updatable. You can just basically, you don't have to build, build it and download that whole you know, gigabyte or four gigabytes. Um, you can just point it to kind of like a package feed, you know, and do like you do with, uh, you know, DNF update or, you know, app get update or whatever, that kind of concept where you're going to update um, to the newest version. Um, it's aware of what packages are installed. It's aware of um, the tools that you have, the Octo Project tools, so you can run BitBake and all those things in it. Um, and it's all based on what's called shared state. So shared state is um, individual tasks that are running to build your image. All those things are, are kind of shoved into this great big um, directory structure, and it remembers all those individual things, so you don't have to redo it again and again and again. So I'm going to show you, um, if we have time, I'll show you the, how fast my build is going to be because I'm going to use shared state. Uh, so again, uh, there was a presentation last year on um, ESDK by Henry Bruce, another colleague of mine. Um, and he works a lot with um, people like the drone team and things like that that are doing application development. So they didn't want to, they didn't need to know or want to know how to build their own images, right? They just want to go and build Node.js apps or something like that, right? So that's that's the people you want to be using that. So um, you can go off and watch, read that, those documents and uh, watch that YouTube video. So, so that's your application developers. This is supposedly, you know, six million developers in the world, right? All know about how to write code and write applications. There's supposedly uh, 60,000 embedded developers in the world. There's probably 60 core Yocto project developers in the world. Um, so these are the tools now for those core, those core things. So um, this one's kind of in between. 
I didn't know, I didn't want to put it in the application developer portion because uh, it doesn't really fit there, but this is a bridge for people who aren't very comfortable with building their own images, but they do want to add packages to it and they do want to generate their own image. So there's a web-based web um, tool called, called Toaster and this knows all about machines and different image targets and all that kind of stuff. But as long as you have fed it the right layers and everything, it, it will actually um, let you choose in a graphical way all the specific packages that you want to add together to build up an image. You don't have to actually edit a recipe or anything like that. Uh, my favorite tool is DevTool. This saves me immense amounts of time. Um, and this was created uh, to fix that problem of all of us being console guys and you know, people in uh, Emacs and Vim and all that stuff all the time. So rather than cutting and pasting and doing all this stuff, um, we created DevTool. So for instance, um, if you want to create a new recipe for something you didn't find in the layer index and you don't already have it, so it's you know whatever it is. So maybe it was the Hello app that we, we built uh, earlier in the earlier session. You can just say DevTool add, give it a name for what you want that package to be known on as, or that wrap recipe to be known as, and then um, give it some kind of URI. So it could be a, a file URL, or it could actually be um, copy and paste what the tarball link was to something you found uh, online, or it could be a Git repository or subversion or whatever. So maybe you found that there's some recipe um, that doesn't work the way you wanted it to. So now you can actually use DevTool Modify. And that's taking something that already exists right now, but it, it lets you go in and actually edit the source code. But then it knows how to generate patches. And then it'll put those patches in with it. And so now you can say patch the kernel, right? Because we had to patch the kernel for the pocket beagle to get the, um, the DTS to work, the device tree to work. Um, or we had to patch U-boot. So that was one way you could have done that. You could have generated those patches by going through this, this procedure. Um, and my personal favorite is DevTool Upgrade because I maintain the MetaPython and MetaPerl layers. And you don't even have to give it a version. You can just say, hey, I want to go and update um, MetaPython PyTest, or, or sorry, Python PyTest, and it'll go and grab the latest version from the net um, it'll create some of these variables like source URI and things like that that we need for the recipe and, um, and then make it easy to build it. So there's a little bit of a workflow that you can use with DevTool. Um, so kind of typical is you're going to add something new. This is where most people want to use it. So you want to you add it, you want to build it, you want to test it, you might have to edit it, and then you're done. You want to commit it. So over here, um, normally I do this animated, but um, so we're going to start off with DevTool add, and what it does is it creates a local workspace, which actually is a Git repository, and it has recipes and source code in that. And so when you do DevTool add, it's going to create a recipe, and it's going to have downloaded this, the source and, and untarred it, ready for you to start modifying it right away if you need to. Then you can do DevTool build, and it's going to, it knows about the workspace, and it's going to go ahead and build that for you, generate the repository, or the, the binary. Um, another fun thing is you can do DevTool um, deploy target. So you could use QMU and de deploy it into a running QMU machine, or you could actually do this to deploy it to the Pocket Beagle. So whatever you just built, in just three steps, you, you already have it on your Pocket Beagle. So now you can kind of test it and figure out what's wrong with it and go back and edit it. And so you can do DevTool edit recipe and instead of trying to figure out where is that recipe, where was that stuff I was working on. And then you can go through this cycle, right, and keep editing, editing, editing. Once you're done, you say DevTool finish and then it goes and shoves it where it belongs, which is in an actual layer, not in your little sandbox workspace. And now you can um, get commit that and then send it to the mailing list or um, you know, save it in your, um, your corporate um, your corporate repos or whatever it is. Um, so a little bit more of an overview of how it works. So when you first run it, you could have run uh, DevTool create workspace workspace, and you can see it's a layer. Okay, so right we, we saw this earlier. It's got a the comp folder with the layer dot comp in it. Um, so 
if we were to say DevTool add and go get the GNU hello world, it's going to um, create folders. So there's a, a appends folder to append or add to a, an existing recipe. It's going to create a, a recipes folder with a hello folder and a hello recipe. It's also going to have those sources. And so in this case, um, it's going to go ahead and um, untar everything, but it's going to make this into a Git repository rather than just a static tarball. But it looks in there at what it, what it found and it says, hmm, it's got a make file, but it's makefile.am. So I bet that that is auto tools. So I'm going to use auto tools to build this recipe, not CMake, not make file, not whatever else, right? So it's pretty smart and it's able to do that, create a recipe and um, if it already has uh, built package data, it'll know even more about what kind of dependencies and things like that might be there. So it'll make sure that it actually brings all that stuff in. If it doesn't have that, it always is going to have parsed data. And so at least it knows about what, what metadata was there that it could parse. Um, so I gave a presentation on DevTool last year. Um, I went through a whole lot of exact steps and demos, I videotaped the entire um, console session and then played it back during my talk. So um, you can see a lot more about how this really, really actually works. I spent the amount of time we're talking today on only that topic. So a lot more there. Um, so the last tool I wanna talk about is um, my, my latest favorite tool um, called the Auto Upgrade Helper. And um, this is a script that basically automates, up, automates any kind of recipes that you've got to the latest version. So I maintain MetaPython and MetaPerl. There's a couple hundred recipes in Perl. There's three, four, five hundred in MetaPython. And those are constantly updating all the time, right, upstream. And you know, do I want to go and like read some mailing list and find out whether or not this Perl recipe updated and then go and hack at the recipe and make the changes myself? Or do I just want to run this, this as a continuous integration Jenkins job once a week that does it for me? Um, so the other beautiful thing about it is that you can set it up to run for all these different hard, hardware architectures, right? So in this class, we're all worried about the pocket beagle, right? But maybe you're going to turn around tomorrow and work on a different thing, you know, an IMX6 or um, you know, a high five board or something like that. And so all of a sudden, you're going to want to build for a different architecture. Um, by the way, that's one of the benefits to me of Yakko Project and Open Embedded is that was a one-liner change in a conf file to switch to a different um, board type. It's a lot more work to do that in build root. Um, and then the next thing I'm going to be adding a lot more of is uh, to allow the, the but it, it'll actually run tests. So not only will it build for these different architectures, but it'll run tests. So there's an uh, ability to run test image, which is the <coughs> All the tests that are in an image, it'll test the whole thing. Or you can run p-test, which is package test um, for an individual recipe and just make sure it actually works. And that might just basically be running like the unit tests and stuff like that that came with that source code. So um, I know I crammed a whole bunch of stuff in there. Um, we're, it's tough to do this class um, and get, we're still struggling um, over, after years of doing Yakko Project Dev Day and so on, we're still struggling with exactly how to pull off the hands-on stuff. So my apologies that we didn't get you to be able to do a whole lot of that today, but, um, but we definitely got time for questions or I, can, I could do a, a quick build, but. Yeah, actually both is great. Um, are there any questions? Because if not, a demo would be fabulous. I think, it, yeah, dev tool demo would be great. All right. Okay, so um, let me, I want to show you the, the, the benefit. Maybe you make your, uh, your uh, fonts bigger. Font bigger, thank you. Oops. That's great, yeah, that okay. works. Um, so I did this build right before, but let me, What I want to show you right now is the benefit of shared state and the shared download directory, right? So rather than doing a full 100% build from scratch, um, 
I'm going to actually, um, sorry. The wonders of doing demos live. Um, so I'm going to go into that Yocto EL recipe that's available on GitHub for, for you guys to go and download. And I jumped ahead, so there's a, I wrote out a full lab manual for each of these layers and how to create them in order. So I started off with a distro layer and then I created a BSP layer and then I went and did the apps layer. But I'm just jumping ahead right now to the, to the end game, right? So this is, this is the result of everything that would have been in the lab. So there's this init script that I've got to run and I need to figure out where, um, where I'm gonna put that. So I'm gonna go ahead and you know, do the sort of the default, but I wanna put it up one layer. And now I'm gonna do, um, Bitbait core image minimal. So normally on a laptop, this will probably take a couple hours, could be four hours for if it's a lot of stuff in it. Depends on how old your system is. If you've got a spinning disk, replace it with an SSD immediately. If you've only got half the RAM that your board can or your laptop can have, replace it with full RAM immediately. But better yet, if you're professional and you are working at this day in and day out, Calculate how much of your time it takes to buy an $8,000 dual Xeon server full of RAM and everything, okay? Figure out how much of your time that is, then calculate how many builds that was and how many days it's gonna take for that to happen and hand that spreadsheet to your boss and say, now, okay? But you have to sell it that way. But trust me, $8,000 will build for you very, very, very fast, okay? And it helps sell Xeons, but um, there's other there's other you know there's other wonderful multi-core, uh, very capable builds out there. Threadripper, which also now apparently has some vulnerabilities. Um, there's also the um, Cavium. So we got a Cavium uh, person here. So there's a Cavium Thunder X, which is 96 core. Um, Xeons these days come with you know 88 cores and so on, and I'm talking too fast because I forgot to say, the first thing it did is it went and it had to build our tool chains, so the native tools, right? But um, it went off and it, it did, um, it got everything from S state, so that magical kind of directory structure I talked about earlier that had all those stored tasks in it, it went and grabbed all of them from there. And by the way, since it had already, I haven't changed anything, it already fetched everything and so on, it didn't even download anything. but if I, um, if I hadn't built some specific thing, but I had downloaded it, it wouldn't have to fetch it anymore, right? So it's not gonna have to go out to the internet and find it, and then download it, and then unpack it. Um, so the last part that it's doing is uh, the image creation. So this built um, Nano and Systemd and a few other things like that, if I remember correctly. Um, and so it's done. So the last bit is always gonna be a bit long, creating the root FS, right? Think about what it's doing. It's taking all those packages you have, running something like DNF install or you know, apt get install, right? And shoving them all into a root FS, taking that whole thing, um, tarballing it up and everything. So there's a, a ton of work going on. It's gonna take a, little, a couple of minutes usually. But, so now, I'm gonna run I'm gonna use a, a handy little script that is, a, is available in the Yocto project called RunQMU. I'm gonna say no graphic because I don't want it to try to bring up a graphic um, interface on a um, server that's you know, 40 miles west of here in, in Jones Farm in, uh, in Hillsborough. And then I'm gonna do slurp, which means don't require any kind of you know, super user privileges to create um, the ethernet uh, tools for me, just, just use user space. So that's, that's what the, these commands are. And I explain all that in the lab manual. So, so please go off and read the lab manual and, and have fun with it and pester me with questions because I didn't explain stuff well enough. So this is all you know, your typical boot stuff. This is your, your operating system coming up. This is all emulated. And um, also if we were running x86 or x86-64, you can also do KVM. So you know, in, sometimes Intel hardware gives you a benefit. Um, KVM would have run this a lot faster, but 
But now I'm worried because it looks like it hung. Nope, okay. So um, I talked earlier about the, um, the Etsy issue file, right? So that's where this wonderful header came from. Um, and then it's kind of auto-populating this line, which, which uh, tells us which version it is and what our target is and what the, um, the TTY or the serial port is. And now we're going to log in with um, root. So I used uh, an, a distro option called um, debug tweaks. And debug tweaks is not for production, it's for development, but it, it's root with no password. So that's what that is. So, okay, so I said, um, oops, sorry. So this is, unfortunately, we had to back, um, we had to escape the, these backslashes, but you know, this is literally what is in this file, the Etsy issue file, that became your login screen or your, your splash screen. So that's why I want you to do a, a distro right away, a distro layer right away, because you, you now, all of a sudden, you branded it, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so you guys did a hello world uh, earlier, right? So that's, that's packaged up. I, I, I took the recipe that you guys created before, put it into the application layer, and added it to the image, and it's, it's there. Um, and also, I went in and showed you how to, uh, I went in and downloaded a, a recipe for the nano editor, and then we went and updated it. And so this is that latest version of the nano editor in there. Um, so there's not a ton of stuff in this image, but, um, but it is there, and it's kind of fun to be able to, you know, have built my own thing and um, be done with it right away. So um, any, is, we got a little bit more time. Um, if you guys, is there something else you'd like to, like you're like burning, dying to see, or questions you want to ask, or you want to just get to the end game and get good seats? I don't mind any, any of the above. But I, trust me, I know this stuff inside and out, so I, I, I could answer any kind of question you got burning in your in your little heart. <laughs> yeah, Dave. Oh, yeah, sorry. This is recorded, so we're going to make sure we capture your questions. And one of the things is, after giving all these talks, I go back and actually watch my own talks because I forget stuff, especially then I notice that I don't hear the questions and I have no idea why I was answering them. Yeah. This is a question on the first lab. The e-al-installer script, I didn't see that on the website anywhere. That's a four gig file that was distributed. Where can we get that? So um, th that essentially is an automation of, of uh, running it straight up. Uh, we should have a lab manual uh, put together for that. We tried to automate it just so we could get around any uh, installation issues and what have you, but um, uh, it, it's literally just a, a straight up uh, make menu, uh, sorry, uh, a Pocky Tiny build. So yeah. uh, we, we will put up a, a PDF file on, on how to, how to uh, uh, essentially do the same thing. Uh, we probably won't bother with how to create the shard file itself because that's that automation is not very useful. Yeah. We can if we if you want, but uh, uh, li literally what what you're building is is uh, what's in any any course, which is just building Pocky Tiny. Any other questions? So if I have uh, three different boards that I'm building for, like revision one, revision two, and uh, somebody else's, uh, I would just have uh, different, I, I could only have my differences be in the board layer or the yes. BP? Yes, so you can have, um, you can have different machines. So uh, what I did, I, I, I wanted to make it simple for us, so I just had the Pocket Beagle machine uh, file in there. But what you can do is you can actually have had um, you know, a Beagle board file and then a Pocket Beagle file, because the Beagle board is essentially you know, the same thing. You know, those two are the same. So, or maybe version one, version two was like a cape. So you had a cape that had, um, a regular white LED, and then the next version you created had an RGB LED. So that RGB LED one needs different support somehow. 
So now you could just create another machine with that or something like that. So, um, so that way, those, those two would, would be building based on top of the same architecture and a lot of the other stuff would be the same. So you probably get fairly quick rep reproducible builds. Um, but if you wanted to switch to a completely different machine, you might just bring in a different BSP layer and those two can live right next to each other and there's no problem building multiple architectures and multiple machines in the same build directory. And so I could have built um, QME ARM, Pocket Beagle, um, and you know, QME x86 all in the same folder. So it's very, very capable of doing that and um, yeah, it, have fun with it. <laughs> Uh, earlier in the talk, you you gave an example of giving a customer an entire layer. Yeah. Uh, say you develop something for yep. them. Um, how? What would they be able to do at that point? Wouldn't they need the other layers in order to yeah. produce their own? Yes. Okay. But if those other layers are all public, you give them some mechanism of getting that whole all that stuff set up. Um, so there's different ways to do this. So there's uh, combo layer, which is how Pocky is built. There's sub, Git submodules, which is what I use because I'm very comfortable with Git. Um, there's another tool that's used in Android workspace or Android world called Repo Tool. Um, Wind River did a version of that or a, used that tool to use a manifest of all the layers. And so it, it brings in all those other dependency layers at the specific versions that they need to be from the specific URLs that they come from and that all, it puts it all together into your workspace, right? Um, but what I'm saying about, you know, that so as a co contractor or consultant, right, you're gonna go off and do all this work, but you don't wanna be constantly called, right? So what you wanna do is you wanna leave behind as much as possible, try to think ahead of all those things that they're gonna want and leave it all in that layer, leave it with them, um, or, you know, have it on your, your own consulting site and let them, you know, get clone it, but, um, but yeah, the, the, Layers is fantastic in, in terms of the modularity, and that was the whole point of um, why we needed um, to change from OE core to, to the modern open embedded and layers. It, it was very important to make that change. Without it, the vendor the vendor problems were just insane. So, yeah, I think we're real close to out of time. But I, I think we should probably stop yeah. there. So, um, I'd um, like to uh, first of all thank. Uh, uh, Tim Orling for his talk on the more advanced side of, of Yocto Project. And I uh, just want to thank you all for coming to all these courses. Uh, uh, we were planning to do this again. Again, just wanted to push the survey. If everyone can give that a, ch a chance, please. Uh, but otherwise, uh, and, and of course, the sign up for the, the mailing list, we will announce when uh, uh, we're going to do this in the future, when boards are available for those of you who want to uh, still buy them uh, and that sort of thing. Um, this is now the uh, 18th uh, time we've done this class in the last two weeks. So uh, thank you very much for uh, yeah. Um, for uh, putting up with, with our, our small uh, issues that we've had over the time. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed and yeah. learned uh, along with us uh, the kinds of things we were hoping you would, uh, we could impart to you. So thank you very much. And please go out and look at that lab manual. Okay.